fiction author Whitley Strieber claims that on the night of December 26, 1985, he was taken from his cabin in upstate New York by non-human entities. Aboard their ship, he was forced to undergo an invasive medical examination while in the company of at least four different types of beings. Whitley's story, as told in his 1987 book Communion, was so incredible that it inspired the major motion picture starring Christopher Walken. And in the following account of his abduction, we'll once again ask the questions. Who are these visitors? Where do they come from? And most importantly, what's with all the probing? Hello, dear people, and welcome back to Paranormal Community College. My name is Riley, and today we're talking about the abduction of Whitley Strieber. I feel like I do a lot of abduction stories compared to other paranormal podcasts, and a part of that is because I'm just simply very interested in them. But also, much of the UFO world doesn't like to talk about these stories. They don't want to be ridiculed. They don't want to lose credibility. And I mean, really, I understand it because the alien abduction phenomenon is pretty crazy. But the fact is, there are thousands of well-documented abduction cases that have been investigated by highly regarded academics, scientists, psychologists, and other researchers, and these stories are often put forth by believable witnesses. When these alleged experiencers tell their stories, you can see they are telling them with genuine sincerity, in most cases. And as far as the abduction of Whitley Strieber, I will leave it up to you guys to decide for yourselves whether or not you think he is believable. But before we begin this story, I'd like to share with you a quote from Whitley Strieber himself in his book, Communion. He writes, When you listen to this incredible story, do not be too skeptical. Somewhere in your own past, there may be some lost hour or strange recollection that means that you also have had this experience. This book is about forming a new relationship with the unknown. Instead of shunning the darkness, we can face straight into it with an open mind. And when we do that, the unknown changes. Fearful things become understandable, and a truth is suggested. The enigmatic presence of the human mind winks back from the dark. So first and foremost, who is Whitley Strieber? Well, Whitley Strieber was born in 1945 in San Antonio, Texas, and as far as we know, he had a pretty normal childhood. He had a passing interest in UFOs and aliens as a child. After all, it was the 50s and UFO fever was in full swing. But as he grew older and as the UFO craze died down, Whitley became ambivalent towards UFOs or anything paranormal. It simply wasn't anything he was interested in anymore, something he had grown out of. He graduated from the University of Texas in Austin in 1968, and then Whitley moved on to New York City. He was very successful in the advertisement world, even becoming a vice president. But in 1977, Whitley left the hustle and bustle of the business world to pursue a career in writing. Whitley had always been imaginative, and he found quick success as a horror fiction writer. While he is now most famous for communion, he also gained notable success through works such as The Wolfen, The Night Church, and The Hunger. By the time we arrive at his cabin in upstate New York, Whitley has a wife named Anne as well as a young son. He has a good social life and has finally achieved a healthy work-life balance. He travels between his cabin in New York City as needed, but the country life suits him and his family well. But before we join Whitley on the night of his abduction, I'd like to make a few quick points. So number one, as previously mentioned, Whitley claims he was not at all interested in aliens or UFOs at this time. He regarded them as quote, false unknowns and considered himself a skeptic. His relationship with UFOs existed only as a passing fancy from his childhood and nothing else. At least that's what he says. Secondly, he recalled many of his memories about the event before hypnotic regression, but yes, he will eventually undergo hypnosis. Number three, he passed numerous medical and psychological evaluations. He passed a neurological exam as well as a polygraph. And Whitley's first thoughts weren't that he was dealing with aliens. He thought for sure he was going insane, that perhaps he was suffering from a brain tumor even. Number four, this area of upstate New York has an impressive history of UFO sightings. In fact, Whitley's abduction actually occurred during the famous Hudson Valley UFO flap between 1983 and 1985. Lastly, I want to explain why Whitley decided on the title Communion, because I think he's actually contributing something very significant to the study of this phenomenon with that. He ultimately believes these visitors seek a deep, perhaps even spiritual understanding of us, that their interest in us and their bizarre interactions with us may be connected to the very nature of the human soul. Like many other researchers contend, 
Whitley suggests that this presence potentially transcends scientific explanation, and he thinks that maybe they are trying to get to the very core of our being. In fact, he refers to these encounters, these abductions, as intimate intrusions of the soul. Ultimately, there seems to be an exchange going on here. But is this exchange for good or evil, or is it indifferent? Is it benign? Do humans have any say in this exchange? It seems as if, unfortunately, we're left largely in the dark here. But let's get to the night of the alleged abduction, shall we? The Strieber family cabin was located in Ulster County, New York. It was the night after Christmas, fresh white snow blanketed the small country neighborhood, and Whitley, Anne, and their son had just finished a cozy meal of Christmas leftovers. Anne and Whitley put their son to bed shortly after. The two stayed up reading and listening to music for a while. Whitley made his rounds around the cabin, making sure the alarm system was armed and that all the doors were locked, an obsessive habit he had developed over the past few months. And by 11 p.m., all had fallen asleep. Sometime in the middle of the night, however, Whitley was awoken by an odd noise. He described it as a kind of whooshing noise, saying that it was, quote, as if a number of people were moving rapidly around the room. He was sitting up in bed now, fully awake, he says, just listening to that eerie, unexplained noise. The room was dark, but since his door was about halfway open, a decent amount of light was coming in from the hallway, at least until the door started to slowly close on its own. Only, as Whitley squinted his eyes, he could see that it wasn't closing on its own. There was a little man pulling it closed from the hallway. Whitley recalls that this little man was about three and a half feet tall and was wearing a rounded hat with a four inch wide brim. And keep in mind, what I'm telling you as of now was remembered by Whitley before his hypnosis sessions. And despite this already bizarre situation, Whitley said he simply laid back down, which sounds strange to us, but it, this actually happens often during abduction experiences. This is what Whitley calls in his book, just one of many inappropriate responses to abductee's experiences. But unlike a typical gray alien, this being had very round, circular black holes for eyes. They were like perfect circles, he says, as well as a circular mouth. He said it was like a big O. And I don't know why, but for some reason, I'm imagining this guy in my mind. And so if you're just listening and not watching on YouTube, Remember the drawing of the Crichton, Alabama leprechaun from 2007? Yeah, that, that's what I'm picturing for some reason. But anyway, Whitley recalls other baffling details as well. He says, quote, From shoulder to midriff was the visible third of a square plate etched with concentric circles. This plate stretched from just below the chin to the waist area. At the time, I thought it looked like some sort of breastplate or even an armored vest. Beneath it was a rectangular appliance of the same type which covered the lower waist to just above the knees. All of a sudden, the creature seemed to rush into Whitley's room with unnatural speed, and it was then that he noticed he was paralyzed. He couldn't sit up or talk or scream or roll over. He realized he was helpless to whatever was about to transpire, and he couldn't imagine just how weird things were about to get, but he said he just knew that things were not going to be okay. After the creature rushed in, Whitley said everything turned black, and then, out of nowhere, he felt himself floating. Somehow, he was naked and his arms and legs were flayed out as if he had been frozen mid-leap. And again, he was aware that he was, quote, profoundly paralyzed. The next thing he knew, he was sitting in a depression in the woods. And in the brush to the left, Whitley noticed a diminutive, vaguely feminine figure in some kind of tan bodysuit and face mask. And on the other side of the depression, he noticed a being in a dark blue jumpsuit who seemed to be walking around rapidly or vigorously working on something. It was hard to tell. He goes on to describe floating above the forest and then he was somehow inside some sort of room, i.e. what many of us assume to be a spaceship, a UFO. Willie describes this first room as circular but very messy. He got the impression that there was just stuff lying all around. And this is a detail that isn't often described in other cases. Whitley said that his initial observations were that the place was just dirty and messy and smelled strange. He also said there were ugly little people running all around rapidly. And inevitably, one of these disturbing creatures pulled out the old handy dandy brain needle. You know, the long metal instrument abductees so often say is inserted into their nose. And at this point, Whitley became terrified they were going to stick this thing up his nose and turn him into a vegetable. 
Not a literal vegetable, of course. I'm not sure if aliens yet have the technology to turn a human into broccoli yet, but he was afraid they were going to turn his brain into scrambled eggs, if you will. Again, not literally, but you get the point. The last thing he remembers is one of the so-called visitors slicing the tip of his finger open, and then it was the morning of December 27th, 1985. Now, when Whitley wakes up, it's not like he remembers all of this at once. He wakes up feeling uneasy, feeling paranoid, feeling like something had happened last night, but he couldn't remember what. All he remembered was being awoken by a bright light for a second, and then seeing a disturbing image of a barn owl outside his window. And as you may already know, owls are weirdly enough associated with a lot of abduction cases. And the idea behind this, which Whitley mentions in Communion, is that these visitors leave us with quote, screen memories. So rather than retain the memory of them, and what they did to us, they'll leave us with something else to replace that memory. Or perhaps our own brains insert a more familiar and less distressing image to cover up the traumatic reality of what actually happened. Over the next few months, Whitley experienced physical and psychological effects that drastically altered his personality. Physical side effects included extreme lethargy, chills, and rectal pain, which was the most baffling to him at first. There also seemed to be a splinter in his finger that he just couldn't fish out. Psychologically, Whitley became hypersensitive and irritable. He was easily confused, felt as if the world around him wasn't real, or that he wasn't real. He began showing signs of PTSD, but he and his wife couldn't think of any reason why he would be showing those symptoms seemingly out of nowhere. He even became hostile and snappy towards his wife. He was trying to, you know, push her away, wanting her to divorce him so that should he end up in a mental institution, she would still be able to remarry and live a good life with her son. He truly thought he was going crazy and that if he didn't end up killing himself, he would end up in the loony bin. No longer the jokester, no longer the happy family guy, Whitley felt himself heading down a dark path. And one day shortly after, while they were skiing, Anne noticed a tiny scab behind Whitley's ear. And while it was so minuscule, he started to remember. More than anything at first, he remembered the smell, the peculiar sour sulfur cinnamon smell, and the memory of that odor opened the floodgates. Whitley started having vivid flashbacks of what had happened to him that night. Now, my thing with the rectal probing is that, yeah, if these beings are so advanced, certainly they wouldn't need a giant scaly instrument to stick up our butts to collect samples or whatever. Like, it seems as if an advanced race of entities wouldn't need to do something so invasive and painful. I mean, we here on Earth, with our rudimentary technology, have less invasive ways of doing things. But you know, maybe they really are just the rejects of the Galactic Federation, going around probing people for fun, and there's no purpose to it all besides the fact that maybe it amuses them, who knows. And this is a silly theory I've brought up a couple times, kind of tongue-in-cheek on this podcast, just, you know, as a joke. But honestly, the more I think about it, the more I'm like, I don't know, maybe, maybe there's something to that. We tend to think that they must be so much more advanced than us, and many believe they are much more morally advanced than us for some reason simply because they can fly around in fancy ships and have mind control or whatever. But what if they're just the perverts of the galaxy? And everyone else in the galaxy is like, yeah, it's freaking weird. We don't know what they're up to either. But anyway, I digress. And by the way, Whitley eventually had that ear checked by a doctor and come to find out there was an unknown foreign object on the back of his ear. And when the doctor tried to extract it, the object shot down to Whitley's earlobe. And long story short, the doctor was never able to fish it out. These flashbacks prompt him and his wife to start looking into UFOs. They start reading book after book, and they start researching the area of their cabin, the Hudson Valley. And they find that this area of upstate New York is rife with UFO sightings and close encounter stories. And after passing numerous different medical exams, so psychological tests, neurological tests, and medical tests, Whitley figures, you know, what the heck, I'm gonna call Bud Hopkins, because Bud Hopkins was a known hypnotic regressionist who specialized in retrieving the memories of so-called alien abductees. And coincidentally, Bud Hopkins lived right down the street from Whitley's office in New York City. So Bud Hopkins meets with him pretty much as soon as he calls, and the two agree to set up hypnosis sessions where Whitley will be regressed by Bud Hopkins, as well as psychologist Dr. Donald Klein. You see, Bud Hopkins was an artist with a fascination for alien abductions and hypnosis. Dr. Donald Klein was a trained psychologist and hypnotherapist, and Whitley wanted a trained professional there. 
But before we get into the hypnosis sessions, I want to highlight some key features of Whitley's abduction that are similar to what others have reported. From the very start of the experience, we see similarities. Whitley says he heard a whooshing noise and then later described it as sounding like a bunch of people moving all about. This whooshing noise is reported in several other cases. Some say it sounds like a washing machine noise, but it's also reported by those who are simply experiencing sleep paralysis. But if Whitley is telling the truth, I think this goes beyond sleep paralysis, but it's a similarity I thought was worth mentioning. Others say they hear a whirring or buzzing noise, so it's very common for abductees to first be awoken by an unexplained noise. More often though, they remember first seeing a bright light, and that plays a role in Whitley's story as well. The beings with a big O for a mouth or very round shaped eyes isn't new either. Although I will admit, if you asked me to name the cases off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. It's also similar to some of the cases from the 50s and the 60s though, where this phenomenon or this presence, these visitors rather, were seen wearing full face masks or even full body suits with mouth and eye holes. And then of course there's that long needle or metal rod that's stuck up the abductee's nose. Not all abduction cases mention an anal probe, not all abductions mention a reproductive exam, but an absurd amount of abduction cases mention this long metal rod or long metal instrument that is inserted into one's nose. And this procedure is oftentimes painful, and it usually leaves the experiencer feeling as if they have been either implanted with something or as something was taken from them. The general stuff, feeling paralyzed, being floated from bedroom to spaceship, and then from strange room to strange room goes without saying, that's present in the vast majority of cases, and while it goes without saying that the greys are involved, they almost always are, abductees also routinely report seeing other types of beings. Sometimes people see hairy dwarf-like characters, other times they see the mantis beings or people who look very human-like. In other cases, you get completely bizarre entities like the wrinkly robot-looking beings from the past Gula abduction. Lastly, going back to the beginning of his experience, one of the first things Whitley does when he wakes up in the middle of the night and hears a strange noise is he immediately looks to the blinking red light of his home alarm system. In several abduction cases, for example, the abductions of David Huggins, who we talked about last month, the experiencer feels much more paranoid than usual in the days, weeks, and months leading up to the abduction event. They obsessively check the locks, check the closets, check under the beds. In Whitley's case, he buys state-of-the-art home surveillance equipment, a little excessive for a nice, safe neighborhood in the Hudson Valley. But back in July of 1985, Whitley was standing in his backyard when he heard the pitter-patter of footsteps running by his pool, but of course, there was no one there. And there had been other times when Whitley was downstairs reading that he had heard those strange, ghostly footsteps. And this all inspired him to set up motion sensors in the backyard, motion sensors that seemed to go off when no prowler from this world or from another could be seen. And then there was the night of October 4th, 1985. And this is when Whitley really began to change. It was just ever so slightly at first with the paranoia and the OCD tendencies, but it was a precursor of what was coming. You see, Whitley always had this itching feeling that something strange had happened that night, but he couldn't remember exactly what it had been. He remembers waking up and seeing a bright blue light coming from the living room. He thought he remembered thinking the house was on fire or that he had left the stove on, but then somehow, he was just back in bed, and he woke up, had breakfast with his wife, his son, and two of his friends who had also stayed the night, but no one really talked about what had happened. They would later just say things like, I woke up to a loud banging noise, or yeah, there was a weird bright blue light that woke me up, or you know, Whitley, I remember you were saying the house was on fire even though everything was fine. And his son later said that he dreamt there were a bunch of little people in the house, that they were like little doctors, and they took him out to the porch and put him on a cot. His son said that they had scared him, but that he kept hearing, quote, we won't hurt you over and over again in his head. But his son said this was, of course, a dream. The strangest dream he'd ever had, but a dream all the same. And it is the night of October 4th, 1985, that Dr. Klein first inquires about while Whitley is under hypnosis. Whitley begins by telling Dr. Klein that he saw a small hooded figure sucking something out of his head, or perhaps squeezing something into his head. He said whatever it was, it made a smacking or kind of squeaking noise. This first initial session didn't last long at all because the sight of this being and the device going into his head was so shocking 
an image so alien to him that he woke up just so frightened and frazzled, saying he didn't think it would be that bad. But he said he felt like that instrument was somehow putting a voice into his head. He said it, quote, had a little thing it could touch to my head and it would make a voice. When Dr. Klein puts him under hypnosis again, Whitley continues with his description of what happened the night of October 4th. He says this little man, this little hooded creature, has those big slanted gray alien-like eyes, that it had this piercing stare, and he reminded him of a bug. He also refers to this ruler-looking device as a wand, and I found that really interesting. If you've read some of Jacques Vallée's work, then you might know why. But this wand, or this ruler that has a metallic tip, he says, the being touches Whitley's head with it, and when it touches his head, he sees a series of images. He sees images of the world being destroyed, of things blowing up. Whitley begins to cry and he says, it's a picture of like a whole big blast and there's a dark red fire in the middle of it and there's white smoke all around. The voice in his head said, quote, that's your home. You know why this will happen. But Whitley says, why? Why are you showing this to me? When will this happen? Why is this happening? And then Whitley is shown images of a green, almost Edenic-like scene where his son is happy and playing and where everything is beautiful again. He then said the being took a long needle and struck it like a match in front of his face. There then was a loud banging noise. Whitley woke up and he immediately jumped out of bed thinking the house was on fire. And when I say Whitley woke up, I mean, yes, one could interpret this interaction with a strange creature as an odd dream and nothing else. But I think for people who have read even just a handful of abduction accounts find themselves coming to the conclusion that this phenomenon isn't happening totally in physical reality. You can call it the dream state or the astral state or maybe it's happening in another dimension, perhaps some kind of space between dimensions, who knows, but the idea is that these dreams are not just dreams. That in these dreams, we are interacting with a non-human intelligence, a very real non-human intelligence, and they're telling us something. They're interacting with us in some way. The question is, what the hell is it all about? The main night in question here, of course, is December 26, 1985. And we're going to head back there in next week's episode. In part two, we'll talk about what Whitley recalled under hypnosis in regards to that night. And we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about Whitley's theories on the nature and potential origin of this presence. And I'll share some other theories as well, including one I bet you haven't heard of before. So stay tuned and until next time, take care everyone.